Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Thursday, the last Thursday of May 2021. Greetings, everybody, for another Facebook Live. We're coming to you today from the penthouse of the legendary Colony Hotel here in Palm Beach, Florida. A big shout out to my friend Bruce Siegel and his lovely bride, Liesl, for uh, making that available to us. And uh, what a great time to be here. It's wonderful weather. It's a little bit out of the season, so the crowds aren't here. A good time to be here. But the most importantly, a good time to be with you and to give you our global travel update. There is so much news. Of course, we'll start with Memorial Day. 37 million of us are going to uh, be traveling this weekend. Most of us have even started by now. 34 million by car, 3 million in the air. That air that airline figure is six times larger than it was last year. Not where we were in 2019, but the airports are going to be crowded. Uh, flights are going to be full. And even though the TSA has asked for not, to hire another 6,000 agents to, t to handle the crowds, they will not be on board this weekend. They're not even hired yet. So expect longer than normal lines. If you've got some questions for me, send them in. I'll be glad to answer them. But more things to report before we get to the questions. Uh, Memorial Day also reminds me of something that was very tragic, a story that I covered. I hate to tell you this. 42 years ago this week. It was on the Friday of Memorial Day weekend, May 25th, 1979, that saw the worst airline disaster in American history. That was the flight, American Flight 191 in Chicago on the Friday of Memorial Day weekend. It was headed to Los Angeles. It had friends of mine on board. No one survived, and people were killed on the ground as well. It was a story that I then investigated and re reported on for years because it became a textbook case of negligence on the part of the airline and almost um, intentional. And uh, a story that I will share with you at another time because it's too long to tell now. But if you research it and see what I wrote about it, um, I did a big story called Aftermath of a Disaster. The stories about American Flight 191 are still being told today. And uh, I, I say this because the, uh, the, the Boeing folks just settled a $17 million enforcement action with the FAA, which, which speaks to the same issues that were there in 1979. Uh, let's just say the airline ignored the maintenance manual, even told the FAA they were gonna ignore it. And you know what the uh, FAA said? Okay. And that's when the problem started. And uh, it's an amazing story and one that we hope will never be repeated, especially now as the FAA is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing, relatively speaking, in enforcing safety and making policy. Uh, but more on that in the days and weeks to come. But I did want to mention that story because uh, uh, it bears repeating. As we know, if you can't remember the past, you're doomed to repeat it. So I'm here to remember that past. Uh, Speaking of Memorial Day, it will also mark the most number of unruly passengers on airplanes we've seen in a long time. And the numbers are staggering. You may have seen the video, it's gone viral, of the fight on board the Southwest Airlines plane that actually sent a, a Southwest flight attendant to the hospital. Uh, the woman involved, a 28-year-old passenger, was arrested for felony assault, taken off the plane, of course, and arrested. Uh, and the FAA, in that case and a number of others, is seeking the maximum of $54,500 in civil penalties for disruption. Uh, and that doesn't count, as we saw in this case, criminal penalties. But let me give you some other numbers. In April and through today, so th almost through the end of May, on Southwest Airlines alone, 477 incidents of passenger misconduct. Let's go beyond that. The FAA has recorded 2,500 plus cases of passenger misconduct, and not surprisingly, 1,900 of them were for not wearing masks. But here's the other ringer here. In many of those cases, the situation was compounded by, what a surprise, alcohol. Now, a number of airlines weren't even serving it. People were either getting on the plane tanks or they were smuggling their own bottles in that they bought somehow, uh, at the airport after they cleared security and brought them in. Uh, there are some airlines now that have resumed serving alcohol, but I can guarantee you that a number of them now are reconsidering that idea 
in the wake of all this. Now, short of putting breathalyzers at, at, at jetways, we got a problem. And it goes beyond just, uh, you know, not wearing masks. It goes to people either on their medications or self-medicating in the wrong way, or even worse, not on their medications, and then compounding that with alcohol. So stay tuned. We're going to be covering that story because it's not going anywhere anytime soon. It's just a matter of how we're going to deal with it. So that's our story with um, with unruly passengers. Uh, we have an opportunity now, as the world emerges from COVID, to not go back to bad habits. Now, I'm trying to do that. Uh, I hope you're trying to do that. Are the airlines trying to do that? Uh, my guess is they're not. They can't help themselves. They're going back to what worked for them before when we lived in the land of the brave and the home of the fee. And, you know, we've got ticket change fees coming back on certain tickets. American Airlines has put bag sizers at departure gates to charge more for checked bags. And the hotels are in the act. They're back with resort fees, even city hotels. There's one hotel in Las Vegas, the height of the insult. They're now charging each guest a $3 and almost a $4 a night utility fee to pay for their electricity. Isn't that what your room rate's supposed to go for? Give me a break. This is not the time to nickel and dime your guests. This is the time to welcome them back with no surprises. Show me a brochure that doesn't have an asterisk and I'm there. The asterisk is the worst symbol in any travel communication, whether it's an, an ad or a brochure, a television commercial, because it's the acknowledgement by the travel industry that they're about to lie to you. And uh, I'm looking for the first asterisk-free destination, the first asterisk-free hotel, the first asterisk-free cruise line or airline. That's who I want to book. Because coming out of COVID, we're no longer seduced by pretty pictures of size zero breast and large women on the beach. We are seduced by the process of travel. We want to know how clean our room is. We want to know what the charges are for. We want to know when we flush the toilet, where does that go? We want to know all about the process of travel because we've been reading up on it. We've had time to read up on it and we've been hot, we've had time to respect it and to understand what's, Im what's important and the actual connecting of the dots. So I'm, I'm saying this as a message to the travel industry. You want us back, be transparent, stop with the resort fees, Stop with, with basic drip pricing uh, or deceptive pricing. And I mean, really, guys, ticket change fees coming back, not a good idea. I mean, it's crazy. And they're trying to get away with it because they can't help themselves. They're going back to it. The accountants are running the asylum. One of the reasons, by the way, and you may not know this, why the airlines make more money from the fees than they make from actually operating the airline is because the tickets get charged at a very high federal excise tax rate. Fees get charged at a state sales tax rate. They're making a lot of money by not putting the fees as part of the ticket price. Why do you think Spirit Airlines can charge $5 a ticket, but the fees add up to $2,500? I'm joking. I don't think there's a, there's a fee, at, I mean, a, a fare at, uh, or a fee at Spirit at $2,500, but you get the point. They've, they've sold tickets for $5, but the fees have to add up to $100. they are making money on the taxes they don't have to pay on the, on the tickets based on the lower taxes they have to pay on the fees. Simple as that. But it's deceptive and it's insulting. We, we need to talk about that just a little more. All right. So, by the way, just a little housekeeping reminder. This Saturday, day after tomorrow, please tune into our show, the radio show called Ion Travel on CBS, because... We're doing a special edition. We're coming to you from the civil rights trail in Alabama. We're gonna move from Selma to Montgomery and talk about the history that was made there and is still being made there, the turning points in the voting rights movement, the turning points in the civil rights movement, and the turning points that are continuing to happen today. Uh, a great place to visit. You walk, you learn, you listen. So many of the people who were there for the Montgomery boycott and the buses, so many people who were there for the march from Selma to Montgomery on the Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, are still alive to tell that story, and we need to hear it. And you will hear it this Saturday, Eye on Travel, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Check your local listings. And if you can't find a station in your area, not a problem. 
go right to our website with the imaginative name, petergreenberg.com, and you'll hit the icon for radio, and we stream it live. So I hope you'll join us there. And for any of you who I can't answer your questions today, we'll do it online or we'll do it on the radio. Uh, now, some cruise news and big cruise news. Right after I saw you last week, the president signed the bill I, I said he was going to sign, which actually provided, provided a waiver to a very old act that dated back to the 1800s that allows now uh, cruise ships that are not based in the U.S., uh, it allows them to sail between two U.S. ports without stopping at a foreign port first. That was the hang-up on the Alaska cruise season because all Alaska cruises usually, not usually, always stopped in Canada to basically comply with that law. The waiver's in place. The president signed it. So by the end of July, early August, there will be a modified but real Alaska cruise season, uh, and they'll be sailing. Uh, and interestingly enough, because they're not stopping in a foreign port, there are different protocols. You're not going to have to get tested to come home because you've never left the U.S. And in terms of shore excursions, since 100% of the passengers will have to be vaccinated in order to get on the ship, and the crew and the, and the officers are already vaccinated, uh, shore excursions will not necessarily be done in a bubble. You'll actually be able to explore without an escort. So lots of things changing. Uh, Royal Caribbean got permission to do their first test cruise out of Florida. That'll happen next month. And that will start uh, start the ball rolling for them to do, you know, basically revenue cruises in July. So things are moving at lightning speed. In terms of overseas, we've talked about this every week now as the European Union starts to open their borders. More and more announcements expected soon. Ireland is going to make an announcement tomorrow uh, about reopening. Big deal there. Spain's reopening June 7th, which means all the Spanish territories reopen. Just like when France reopens, Tahiti reopens. And all the French islands in the Caribbean reopen. Uh, the one holdout right now, the United Kingdom. But I'm telling you now, I would almost bet my career that they'll make, it, make an announcement before June 15th or June 16th that if you're a vaccinated, fully vaccinated American, you can come to the United Kingdom without quarantining. That will coincide, gee, what, a, what, a, what, what an amazing surprise with President Biden's visit to Europe for the NATO summit and will give him an opportunity to return the favor by then saying that fully vaccinated Europeans can now come to America without quarantining and the race is on. So watch this space, but I'm telling you, it's going to happen. Uh, so. Those are my little reports for this week. We've got tons of stuff to talk about. Don't forget the Selma Montgomery show this Saturday. But now let's go to uh, let's go to some of your questions. I'm going to scroll up here so I don't miss anybody. Okay. Uh, Ann says, good morning from New Jersey. Did I find out anything about my NCL sailing in December since I cannot get a vaccine and have a doctor's note to that certification? What I found out, Ann, is they haven't made a decision yet. They've made no decisions. However, remember, under the CDC guidelines, 95% of all passengers must be vaccinated. So you may fall into that 5%, which was initially uh, done for the benefit of the kids under 16, who at that point couldn't get a vaccine. Now it's dropped down to 12. And as soon as we get that information, we'll let you know. But right now, there has been no determination from the cruise lines as to what you can or can't do. Uh, Max Felder, my buddy Max, Greetings from Lonelyville. Does anybody here other than me and Max know where Lonelyville is? Other than my previous dating experiences when I was single? Ah, no, you know where Lonelyville is? On one of the most beautiful places on the planet. And that's called Fire Island, New York. It's one of 19 communities on an island that's only 32 miles long, never more than a third of a mile wide. And you can only get there by boat, unless you're going to the end of the island to a state park. But for all intents and purposes, there are no cars on Fire Island, what a beautiful place to be. Uh, Patrick says, good morning from Beverly Hills. Kimberly says, hope I'm well, I am. Scott says, hi from Jacksonville. Uh, I'm in Pompano Beach, visiting not far from you. Okay, Tanya, all right. Uh, all right, all right, I'm going down this here. Uh, Marcy, thank you so much. David Scott Jones, again, how are you, sir? Uh, hello from Williamsburg. Uh, hello back to Williamsburg, by the way. Uh, Okay, recommendations. This is from Chris. Recommendations for things to do in Lower Peninsula, Michigan on vacation. Yeah, go to the Upper Peninsula. <laughs> That's my favorite. You know, that, 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 in fact, that reminds me so much of Fire Island. Um, 
I don't know. I'm not going to tell you I don't know that much about the Lower Peninsula. But you know what? Between now and next week, I'm going to give you my recommendations. I'm going to go back into my research files and tell you what I know. But any chance you get to go to the Upper Peninsula, that's where you want to be. Uh, Jack Korber asked a question that makes me angry, not because you asked it, Jack, but because of the nature of the question, because of what it means. What happens to trip insurance when a cruise is canceled? You lose your money. Uh, it, it, first of all, it's the kind of insurance you're buying. Is it trip cancellation and interruption insurance? You might be covered. Is it is it canceled because of the pipe because of the pandemic? You may not be covered. You know, other than refunds, it's the second largest source of complaints that we've had since the pandemic started. So the biggest the, the biggest wrinkle about insurance is you're going to buy an airline ticket or a cruise trip. You're buying it in advance, and we, a lot of us do that. The insurance that we're buying normally. We tend to buy it at the time we buy the trip, except and by, if you go online, you know that you can't even complete the transaction unless you opt in or out of the insurance, right? Here's the problem. Your refund rights and in insurance expire two weeks after you buy the insurance. Trip hasn't even left yet, and you can't get your money back. It's I am really unhappy with them. I'm waiting for an insurance company to realize that the concept of insurance is protection and honesty and transparency. I understand pre-existing conditions, right? I mean, I can't buy fire insurance if my house is already on fire. I get that concept. But what you're doing right now is engendering more bad will and bad faith uh, among people who got burned once in 2020 and don't want to get burned again. I'm addressing, of course, the insurance companies. I'm waiting for you to come up with a product which, by the way, I would understand if it had a higher premium as long as it delivered the goods when we needed it, right? The three things that travelers don't want to talk about, but we're all thinking about, are these. Number one, I don't want to go somewhere and get stuck and can't get home. Number two, I don't want to go, I don't want to try to go somewhere, have the trip canceled and not get my money back. And number three, if something happens, I don't want to find out I bought worthless insurance. Have I basically summed it up? For all of you, why can't the travel industry figure that out and then create a product that meets those needs? And it's a win-win. Charge me more, but deliver on the goods. All right. Uh, thank you, April, for that note about 191. Uh, I will talk about it in the next couple of weeks because it does bear a longer conversation. Uh, all right. Here's one from Patty. A beautiful apartment. It is a beautiful apartment right here. Uh, at the at the colony, wish it was mine. I'm just borrowing it. Thanks again <laughs> to Bruce Siegel. Uh, all right, from Jonathan Atkin, great photographer and a Coast Guard captain. I think he has a hundred ton license. Or, no, excuse me, I take it back. He's got his masters, and uh, he's got me beat by by a couple of tons. Hello, Jonathan. Um, uh, David Scott Jones says, when do I think that mask wearing on planes will end? End of this year. You're going to be stuck with it till the end of this year. So bear with that. The federal government moves slowly and everybody wants to CYA, if you understand that technical term. Um, have I heard of Kovac Global? Ellen and I have. It's a relatively new company. Uh, they were started as a result of the problems with insurance to base, and it's not insurance. They're sort of a rescue firm that if you get COVID overseas, they'll come and basically fly you home. It's another form, if you will, of medical evacuation and repatriation insurance, but it's specifically geared for one particular type of problem, otherwise known as COVID. That's why they called it, uh, I think, COVAC Global, get it? Um, all right, greetings from India, from Amit. Um, traveling is simply awesome. I believe it helps us to explore ourselves and our planet amazingly. You're right. And you know what? I'm waiting for India to get back on track. One of the most incredible countries I will ever see and have ever seen. And as much as I've seen India, I have seen this much. It is completely daunting and eye-opening, and I'm looking forward to the time when we can safely return. Uh, all right. Uh, hello, Peter. UA191. Actually, it wasn't UA191, Scott. It was American 191. Um, and uh, yes, that newspaper photo that one person took was haunting. I will set the scene for you. As the plane lifted off of the runway at O'Hare with a full load of passengers, just as it cleared about 300 feet, 
the left engine flew off the wing. It basically ripped off from the wing, severing all the hydraulics. The plane essentially became asymmetrical. It did like this, became inverted, and within about 52 seconds, uh, crashed into a fireball. And uh, of course, no one survived. But the reason why it crashed and how that was allowed to happen is what we'll talk about at another time. Um, okay, Angela. Ah, I love this from Angela Batista. She says, I contested resort fees at a hotel in Boston this past weekend and won. Yes, you did. Everybody needs to know you can vote with your wallet. If a resort fee is not disclosed to you at the time you make a reservation, if the resort fee is not disclosed to you at the time you check in, and all of a sudden it shows up on your bill, guess what? Get your photocopying machine out and dispute the charge. And send it to me. I'll help you. It's called failure to disclose. Not only that, can somebody please disclose to me what a resort fee really is, if only other than an attempt to be competitive on rate, but not on value? It's a way to maximize your room rate by telling people they got a lower room rate and then adding on costs for things they're already expecting and have already expected, like a towel, access to a beach chair at the resort, and things like that. Uh, yes, I'm happy the cruises are resuming too. Uh, Patty's got the right one, AA crash 1979. Uh, any news on when Portugal will open to US citizens? It's imminent. It's imminent. Remember, Spain has already announced June 7th. And you know what? Portugal will not be far behind. Now, what Portugal has done is they're limiting UK travelers because of the number of cases still in the UK. But here's the deal. We've morphed from a public health issue into an economic one. And it's more about who's been vaccinated, who's coming to your country, than it is about who's been vaccinated in your country. And that's why these countries are opening up because we've got a high level of vaccination. Okay, uh, let's keep going down here. Uh, ah, Lorraine has got some stuff by the Straits of Mackinac. We're talking on the Lower Peninsula, right? And let's not forget Mackinac Island. Uh, another place like Fire Island with no cars, but they do have horses, so watch your step, if you know what I mean. Uh, okay, Clarice says, oh, thank you, Clarice. Uh, and, Who's asking this question? Oh, it's Joy Daniels. Is it really necessary to get travel insurance if the airline is offering you another flight within a year if you need to cancel and hotels refund your money if you cancel within a few days before you travel? When should you purchase travel insurance? Joy, let me let me work this out for you. There are a number of different kinds of travel insurance, right? There's trip cancellation and interruption insurance. That's really what we're talking about. That's what you see when you go online to make an airline reservation. But it's got so many exclusions in more cases than not, it's worthless, especially in a pandemic, right? Now, if you have tremendous flexibility in your schedule and the airlines are offering you either that terrible credit voucher, right, the world's worst gift certificate, or another flight, and you can live with that, then don't buy the insurance. But the other reason why you buy the insurance has nothing to do with the airlines. What happens if you get sick? What happens if you can't go because of a bona fide illness? That is what's covered. So think about that. Uh, okay. Another question about COVAC Global for repatriation back to the U.S. You know what? The membership is expensive. I agree with you, Sandy. The one I use is MedJet Assist. They do have coverage for COVID. Check it out. But read the language to see if you're covered for it. They, they do have some age restrictions. Um, and I've had my card for 20 years. And if there's any wood here, I think there is. Okay, I've just tapped on it. I've never had to use it, but I'm very glad I do. Uh, Travel Guard also has a very good uh, medical evacuation and repatriation policy. COVAC is one with sort of like no questions asked, they'll get you out, and it is a much more expensive policy. Uh, all right, let's keep going. Uh, hey, John Valdastri, I tell you, John Valdastri works for United in, in Newark. He used to work for Continental at Newark before they merged, and of course, John had to shame us all by posting a picture of him on his cart going through the gates of Newark with the boss. I'm jealous. Okay. Uh, Gina, do I know for how long negative tests will be required to return to the U.S. from Europe for vaccinated travelers? I don't think they're going to make a distinction, Gina. I think that's going to be through the end of this year at least. Same thing with the mask requirements. Uh, okay. Uh, 
Ah, Gina says, Med Jet Assist has a Memorial Day weekend sale going on. Who knew? Thank you, Gina. I'm going to scroll back up to see who I missed. Hold on a second, because there are lots more to talk about with you guys today. Um, and while I'm doing that, let me tell you this. I love this story because if I were in the commodities business or speculating in the commodities business, which I'm not, uh, I'll lead into that for this. The American Society of Plastic Surgeons said, you'll love this pandemic, folks. There was a 22% increase in butt implants in 2020, perhaps because a lot of sitting leads to, this is their quote, uh, general flattening. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because if I were in the commodities business and I wanted to make a lot of money, and, and if this such commodity was on the, was being traded, I would invest in pants futures. Because in the not too distant future, all of us are going to have to realize we got to wear pants. We're going back to work. And then comes the second realization that, uh oh, the pants don't fit anymore. Got to buy, here comes new pants. Let's go to the commodities board and make sure they come up with pants futures. Count me in. I just had to say that. All right. Now, we had a question last week that I promised you an answer to, and it came uh, from James Zeller. Is it possible to use a CPAP machine on flights given the current mask requirement? And the answer is, yes, it is. And uh, American, for example, allows you to use your machine on board, uh, but it wants you to bring your own batteries. They, they cannot uh, use an outward power outlet. You can, but they're not always available. Bring your own batteries. Delta, they allow them to use on board, but they don't provide power. So you got to bring batteries to last at least one and a half times as long as the flight time. United, they just want to know 48 hours ahead of time that you're coming with the CPAP machine and everything's going to be okay. Now, Colleen Casey says, if you're fully vaxxed, do we have to prove we test negative for COVID-19 going to or returning from France? Uh, yeah. Uh, France is currently right now locked down, but they're about to open very much. I mean, like June 9th, it's coming up. And uh, so get ready. They're going to ask for that uh, negative COVID taste. And by the way, I'm going to be reporting on June 5th on the very first U.S. passenger ship to sail. It'll be the Celebrity Millennium going from St. Martin. No U.S. ports involved. But under St. Martin rules, I have to provide a negative COVID-19 test five days before, well, you know, within five days of the departure from St. Martin and the U.S. rules on the way coming back within three days of my return. Uh, the cruise ship obviously is, is providing those tests free of charge on board to all passengers. Uh, so there you have it. The, uh, you're gonna have vaccination requirements. It's coming up as well on cruise lines. Uh, it's happening on the one I'm on. So bring your cards. We had a question uh, from Roy about taking, something I've always wanted to do by the way, the auto train from New York to Florida. He says with rental cars being so expensive, I'm planning on driving. Rental cars are very expensive. Rental car rates right here in Florida for a small car, a baby Mazda, $441 a day. And uh, that doesn't count mileage caps, drop-off fees, and my favorite subject, the refueling charge, which can be as high as $11.5 a gallon. Hertz is charging $9.99 a gallon. Makes you think you're getting a bargain. If you're going to rent a car, no matter what you're paying for it, fill it up before you return it or be, be prepared to literally, you know, dig into the wallet. But he wants to know about the auto train and the prices. Uh, here's the deal. It goes all the way down from New York to, uh, to Sanford, Florida. Uh, and, uh, ah, okay. You can, and you can do it. Uh, there's a difference he wanted to know. Uh, is it different between uh, a regular car and an SUV? The answer is yes. There's about a $300 differential, but the train is operating. Uh, so there's some answers for you there. Uh, I'm going to continue on. I got lots of questions I'm going through here. I printed them out. Uh, oh, on my June cruise, uh, Jay Dector wants to know, I'm anxious to see how your cruise goes. Me too. I'm interested to know how they're handling meals. Have they done away with the buffet? Are they cleaning rooms each day? And what about shore excursions? Can people go about independently? Number one, uh, kiss the buffet goodbye, at least in its traditional incarnation. There will be a buffet. What you're going to do and what cruise passengers will do is it will be a staffed buffet. So you will have a plate. Uh, actually, you won't even have a plate. 
you will come up to the buffet line and you'll point to what you want. It will be plated for you and brought to your table. Kind of like that idea. Um, and you asked about cleaning rooms. Uh, they will probably not do that. They will probably put a, extra towels and pillows, washcloths, soaps, and sundries in your, in your cabin. And there'll be almost contactless delivery of anything you order into your room. Now, you also asked about shore excursions. That's still in a bubble. Uh, it's not like the Alaska model I gave you uh, because you're going to be going to vetted locations in a foreign country or in this case, foreign countries. And when you go off the ship, you'll be going off as a group escorted by, by ship's officers in that bubble. Uh, and that's what's going to be for at least the first couple of cruises. Uh, and uh, ah, this is also interesting. We talked about celebrity cruises. I'll be on that. I'm only going to be on for a couple of days to report on it for CBS. I'm not taking the full seven-day cruise. However, this is a question from Marge who wants to know, I'm receiving conflicting information from two different people about mask policies. One person said masks on the ship are mandatory except for swimming and eating. They can't make them mandatory for swimming. Sorry. Uh, another said they haven't determined any mask policy yet. The answer is no one knows. Except to tell you this, your first two days on the cruise, they're going to make you wear your mask for everything other than swimming and eating uh, in public areas, not in your cabin, but in those areas. If you're up on the deck by yourself, probably not. They're going to enforce social separation and distancing. But my guess is that's for the first couple of cruises to see how it happens, how it works out, and then they'll make some adjustments. Okay. Uh, now I'm going through two more questions about Kovac Global, Global which we already answered. And now we're going to go to our picture of the week. If you get a chance to look at this picture, you got to look at it three different times because the colors are so amazing. And I hope Anthony can, can post it. There it is. That's a picture. You know where it is? I'll tell you. It was taken by uh, Michael Rundle of Utah Zion National Park. Uh, and he took it while he was on a hike to the top of Angel's Landing Trail a remarkable, you know, in, photo, in photography, it's all about the light and the lighting. And whether you planned it this way, or you just got lucky, Michael, you, you waited for the right light. You got it. Congratulations. If you have a picture of the week you want to submit, you know how to do it. Send it in to me, peter at petergreenberg.com. We'll pick it and post it. But Michael, that was truly a stunning photograph. Uh, here's one from uh, Nanette. I'm hoping we will be able to go ashore in the Mediterranean independently rather than being required to go on a ship excursion. Any updates on that? For the moment, no independent excursions. You can't explore a port on your own. This will probably change by August. But for June, July, and maybe the first part of August, everybody's basically experimenting to see what's really needed. And they're erring on the abundant, with an abundance of caution. Uh, from Sam, can I please address thoughts of if Italy will allow vaccinated travelers from the U.S. in regardless of whether they're COVID tested or before the EU change on July 1st. Uh, you've got tickets to, uh, to uh, oh, to Rome, okay, uh, on American Airlines on June 16th. It's still not a COVID tested flight. At this point, here's the only thing that's off the table, quarantining. When the EU countries open up, they're letting you come in if you're fully vaccinated without having to quarantine. About the testing, that's different. Each country is going to have a different testing protocol, and that is subject to change. So let's talk about this next week, right after we see what happens when the other EU countries open up and see what they're doing, because you're going to be following the leader here, no matter what. Uh, ah, what are the restrictions for entering Poland and returning to the U.S.? Right now, Poland is still in lockdown. So we'll know more about that next week. Uh, Paul, Airbnb CEO said, business travelers, we know it, will never come back. Do you agree with this? I don't. We have to define business trips in, in different segments. If I'm the parts department of IBM, and I want to talk to the sales department of IBM, well, I don't have to wear pants. I can do it as a Zoom call. But if I'm the sales department of IBM, and I want to send sell you, Paul, a mainframe computer, I better get off my ass and come see you. Nothing beats the, the, the power and the impact and the success of in-person face-to-face meetings. And when the tide will change, when all this will turn around, 
will happen when you just need one Fortune 500 company sales department saying, enough of this, we're getting back on the road to see to meet our clients. And when that happens, none of the other Fortune 500 companies want to be at a competitive disadvantage, and it will trickle down from there to all businesses, and that kind of business travel will return. The interdepartmental business travel uh, will probably not come back for a long time because the CFOs of these organizations are looking at the bottom line saying, hey, we did okay without that. And they'll win that battle. They will not win the sales battle. And they will not meet, win the meetings and conventions battle because that's part of sales. They'll come back by next year. Uh, all right, does Turks and Caicos require a negative COVID test there and back? Not only that, they require proof of insurance. Just so you know, uh, Julie wants to know, do you have the update on travel to Canada? I do. Remember last week I said they were supposed to reopen the borders or at least tell us about it by May 21st? Well, right after I talked to you last week, they told us about it. They kicked the can down the road again to June 21st. And you know what's going to happen in June? They'll probably kick it back one more time to July 21st because my prediction is the minute the UK says you can come if you're fully vaccinated, Canada will have no choice but to open the land borders. As for the sea borders, meaning the ports, they're going to stay closed for a while. But we've circumvented that now with the new waiver and the bill that was signed by the president, and that's allowing for ships to sail to Alaska. All right, let's keep going here. Uh, all right, I'm interested in volunteering for a test cruise. How should I go about this process? Marielle, let me answer this right now. You're too late. When Royal Caribbean announced it five or six months ago that they were thinking about doing it, they got 100,000 volunteers. So if you want to be the 100,000th and once, <laughs> sign up. It's not going to happen for you. Sorry, you're going to have to pay. Uh, all right. Uh, curious to hear your thoughts. This is from Lynn. Is it just me or does it seem like Mexico's tourism has been booming lately? No, it's been booming lately. Huge numbers of Americans going down. The two biggest destinations in this part of the world, Mexico and the Dominican Republic, and they're both, and the numbers in both are continuing to grow. Uh, William wants to know, when will these airline prices go down? I'm afraid to look at them now. Yeah, me too. You may remember about eight weeks ago, I told you that my airfare from New York to Los Angeles on American Airlines on their nonstop flight was $90. You know what it is today? It's six fifty dollars and higher, right? Airline fares are going at the rate of, they're increasing at the rate of 7 to 10% a week. That's compounded, do the math. But here's the irony that you can take advantage of within the next three weeks. Go online and look at business class fares, not coach, business class fares between the U.S. and Europe. And, and look out about 330 days. In many cases, you will see fares in business class that are, that are matching the coach fare between New York and L.A. That's where you strike, right? Now, how long will they last? Not long, because the minute the European Union completely opens up, ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. But do it now. Do not wait. The same thing applies if you've got frequent flyer miles lying around. I say this every week. Do it now. Now, this week, by the way, America and JetBlue just announced they're commingling their frequent flyer programs, meaning you can earn JetBlue miles on American flights and vice versa. Here's the only rub. Up until this week, the miles that you earned on JetBlue, you earned based on the length of the trip, not the fare you paid. Effective immediately, JetBlue has now gone to a fare-based system, so you'll get less miles based on, or more miles based on how much you paid. All right, let me continue to scroll down here. I don't want to miss anybody. We've also posted where you can find our radio show streaming live, so check out the scroll. Uh, I'm still going down. Lots of questions here. Ah, hello from uh, Split in Croatia. Hello right back. We're coming over to Zagreb in July. We'll be doing one of my television shows there, so we're not going to be far from you. Um, ah, Robert says, I'm vaccinated. When do you think Hawaii will allow us in an island hop without having to test? Imminently. We'll be doing uh, a Facebook Live from the island of Kauai at the end of June. We're planning on going to do one of my television shows there. 
So by that time, I'm almost going to guarantee you that all the islands in Hawaii will be on the same page. So stay tuned. Uh, all right. Julie says, will gas prices continue to rise over the summer? Yeah, that's when they go up. It's based on demand. Uh, it's already over $3 in Northern Virginia. Well, I'm jealous. I'm paying four and a half in New York. So uh, maybe I'll come to Virginia. Hi from Dallas, this is Brian. And, and uh, oh, Jeanette Gaines says, regarding credit card disputes with the airlines not refunding now that travel is coming back, can the airlines do a charge back to the credit card holder if it's been over a year? Under the rules, anything over 60 days gets questionable. So over a year is something else. Remember, we're still waiting to hear the reaction from the letters that were sent from Senators Blumenthal and um, Markey to the presidents of all the airlines saying, do the right thing. You're holding over $10 billion in passengers' money. They don't want credit vouchers. They don't want, you know, redone flights. They want their money back. Uh, stay tuned. This flight's not over yet. And it goes beyond your credit card rights because that's those have already been exhausted if you waited this long. However, legislation has a nasty effect of uh, retroactively dealing with, dealing with this, and we hope it will. Uh, ah, April agrees with me. The Upper Peninsula is incredible. Um, any update on traveling to Cuba? You got to give the Biden administration time to redo those policies that were reversed uh, by the Trump administration. Uh, it will happen. Uh, it will be a negotiation because uh, because there are other issues on the table now that have that have you know shown up since the reversal of those policies. But my guess is within the next year they will be reversed. They'll be much uh, they'll be streamlined, and we won't have to play any more games. Now, having said this, there are still two thousand people a month, two thousand Americans a month, who sneak into Cuba from any one of five other countries, right? Mexico, Cayman Islands, Jamaica, Canada, and I'm forgetting one more, oh, the Bahamas. And the Cubans don't stamp your passport. Officially, you weren't there. So I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just letting you know it's being done. Um, ah, Captain Atkin, Jonathan says, Lonelyville, one of the oldest Fire Island communities dating back to 1905. Uh, the community where I grew up in, Seaview, our house was built in 1916, but there's an older one than that. That's Point of Woods. That gets back to the turn of the last century in the, in the later part of the 1890s. Uh, all right. Uh, ah, New Buffalo, Michigan, another Lower Peninsula suggestion from, from Robin. Thank you, Robin. Okay. Uh, when do I expect car rental prices to drop back down to reality? Not this year. Remember, it's about supply and demand, and they don't have supply. Uh, the car makers haven't been able to ship the new ones in. We have a new model year coming. So they'll get new cars sometime in October, November. It should stabilize by December. That doesn't mean the prices are going to go dramatically down, but they will go lower. Uh, okay. Uh, ah, Gina says, my clients were either able to move their trip insurance to a future trip or receive a refund. Ah, they, they booked through a travel agency. I'm telling you. Never book travel insurance online. Gina is absolutely right. Go through a travel agent or a travel advisor. They can walk you through the hieroglyphics and the policy language, and they can also give you an idea of what's covered. And most importantly, remember this, what's not covered. Then you can make an intelligent choice. Uh, yep, Mike Lukens, you heard correctly. I will be on the Millennium on June 5th, reporting on that for CBS. Uh, Okay. I'm looking at some more questions here. All right. I'm being offered beer and sightseeing in Split. Thank you. I'll let you know if we get there. Uh, wow. All right. Uh, Oscar wants to know, is there a possibility to travel to Australia this October? Yes, if you're a kangaroo. Uh, Australia and New Zealand are staying within that bubble. They've made public statements already that they're not expecting to open at least until January of 2022. And my guess says it'll be even longer than that. Uh, okay. Ah, Gada wants me to come visit Egypt. You know what? We're trying to get over there again. 
Uh, I try, normally I'm in Egypt twice a year. We've done a number of our television shows there. Uh, I miss it. And especially going back to the GEM, the Grand Egyptian Museum, which was supposed to open about a year and a half ago, and we're now getting ready for it to open this year. I encourage you all to go. It's an amazing experience. I was there when they were building it, but they were operational in their research departments already and in their restoration rooms. And I will tell, I'll clue you in on the little thing they do there. It sounds pricey. Trust me, it's worth it. For $250, they'll bring you back into the restoration rooms where you're going to be up close and personal with all the very the, the skilled workers back there unearthing literally everything that's being brought in every day. What a trip of discovery and amazement. Uh, you're not looking at anything behind a glass case. You're looking at it basically this close. Uh, I encourage you to do that when you go to Egypt. Uh, so how many times will the COVID test be free? Susie wants to know. I'm traveling on a Thursday international flight. So if I test on Monday to get results by Thursday, but it won't be acceptable on Friday. You know what? I have the same problem, right? I'm getting tested all the time in New York. And as long as I go through New York City Department of Health, there is no limit. It's a service they must provide, and we're very happy that they do. Uh, okay. I heard on Chicago local news the TSA are requiring masks until September 13th. Any confirmation on that date from you? Absolutely not, Scott. Federal government's given no guidance on that. I'm telling you right now that, that my bet is through the end of this year. Uh, okay. I'm still going down this. All right, a few more. Ah, Florina says they're not going to bring me back into the restoration room. I make you, Florine, let's, let me double check that because the museum has not officially opened yet. I think they're going to do it. It's a great source of income for them. They limit the number of people at any one time. Uh, it would be a shame if they stopped it, but thank you for updating me. We will check it. I'll let you know next week, okay? We're talking about the restoration room at the Grand Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Um, all right. Now, before I forget, because we're almost out of time, a couple of housekeeping reminders. Again, our radio show this Saturday comes from the Civil Rights Trail in Alabama on the road from Selma to Montgomery with the people who live that, the people who live that history and are still making history. I encourage you to listen in. Of course, see if that's, up, that's on between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern time this Saturday. You can always go to our website. We posted it on this today uh, to let you know how you can listen to it live streaming if you can't find a station. If I didn't get a chance to answer your question today, email me anyway, peter at petergreenberg.com. We'll answer it either online or on the show. And until next week, please drive safely. Please fly safely. It's going to be a very crowded Memorial Day weekend. And one last shout out, speaking of Memorial Day, to all my fellow firefighters in New York who will be on duty this weekend, as will I. And we'll see you next week for another Global Travel Update. And next week's coming from Oregon. So stick around. We'll see you next Thursday. Bye-bye, everybody.